Thanks for having me today. My name is Lisa Bramer. I'm going to talk to you about, so I'm a data scientist here at PNNL. I'm going to talk to you about using um, small multiples to visualize and interact with multiomics data, but I'm going to show a particular example um, from Dr. Kristen Burnham Johnson's data that she generated on one of her projects with um, leafcutter ant fungal gardens. So it's not a surprise as the technology has now gotten better. We're able to generate large and complex data. Um, if you, some of you may know the Human Genome Project took off. It took, you know, 20 some odd years. It cost $3 billion for us to sequence one human genome. And now you can, you know, deposit your sample and get a full genomic workup for three to $5,000. So because things become cheaper, we said, oh, we should just generate more data. We'll learn more that way. Um, when in fact, as a, at least as a data scientist, I'll tell you, you generate more data, you generate more really cool stuff to look at. We start to analyze it and we generate more problems or things to think about. So every time you analyze the data, you're, you're generating more data. So I wanna to talk today about how do we take this really large and complex data and do what I'm gonna call a deep analysis of that data. So when I talk about large and complex data, um, what I'm really talking about is maybe you have a large number of records or cells, um, you have lots of variables, you might have complex structures. We're gonna talk about mass spec imaging today, right? That That is, uh, not a data type that's really readily put into tabular form, or you have intricate patterns and dependencies that are gonna require some more complex models than just a t-test. And what do I mean by deep analysis? Well, as a data scientist, I will tell you, data doesn't come with a model. If you think you know the algorithm or model to apply and simply apply it, you're not actually doing data analysis, you're just processing data. So. When we're talking about deep analysis, we really, it means a lot of trial and error, looking at the data, hypothesizing what's going on. And ultimately it really means a lot of visualization. So the, um, Mark did a great job of, of demonstrating this. I'll show an example in just a, se a second here, but um, as a statistician, John Tukey's quote where he talks about restricting one's self to just planned analyses is really, and failing to explore the data loses sight of the most interest of the most interesting results too frequently to be comfortable. And so the argument I'd like to make to you today is that data summaries are useful and we do them all the time. We create PCA plots, we create U maps. They have utility. We had some discussion about what their limitations are, right? I want to push you and say we have to be able to go past these initial plots to really dig into our data and find all of the stories that are there. So often cases like uh, our goal nowadays is to do machine learning and say, can I do peer classification or prediction? And we just, um, we evaluate our results based on how well we predict. But how do I know I don't have bad data going into my model? Um, most of the tools and approaches that summarize data, they make a single plot. And the story has to be bigger than that after you spend thousands to tens of thousands of dollars on your data. The, I, this is not to say that summaries don't have their place, they do. But what I would like to argue for is that we should really be visualizing and analyzing our data in detail, this deep analysis, even when the data sets are really large, like they are in the case of spatial transcriptomics or spatial proteomics. So bear with me for a slide or two while I talk a, a little bit on just the data science side. One approach to solving this problem is that we can use what's called divide and recombine. So that's where I start with my data and I break my data into subsets, um, I apply some sort of analytical method 
get an output. That analytical method is the same thing. And I recombine my data. So if anyone here is a computer scientist or familiar with it, this might sound a lot like MapReduce. It's not MapReduce, but it makes heavy use of it if you have a lot of data. So how do I choose a division? Well, if I'm a statistician and I have a large amount of data, I might just randomly partition my data into blocks. Um, but if we think about just a very basic example, let's suppose you have data where you have 25 years of 90 daily financial variables for 100 banks in the US. I think we'd all agree you're not going to just slap this data into Excel and make a plot and be able to read anything. So maybe we would break the data up by bank or by year or by some geographical variable. And in this case, the computations, models, and visualizations become embarrassingly divisible or parallelizable. In biology, we often have these really um, natural breaks in our data. So I want to provide just one really basic example to motivate this. So in order to recombine the data, one thing that we think about are what are called trellis displays. There's a statistician named Edward Tufte, who really um, pioneered trellis displays. And that's really just making the same plot on multiple divisions of your data and putting them next to one another. And the human eye is actually very, very good at discerning differences or trends in the data. So on the right, I have data from R.A. Fisher, probably arguably the most famous statistician of all time. They were collecting barley yield way back in 1931 and 1932. And they did this for many different plots, many different farms, um, and several different species of barley. And if you look at this plot, hopefully by eye, you notice that there's something fundamentally different with the Morris plot. So this is uh, Minnesota. So at Morris, you notice that the 1931 yields are to the left of the 1932. And in every other plot, the trend is different. So it turns out that somebody back in the day when we recorded data by hand made a mistake in recording this data. And that mistake went unnoticed for 60 years until somebody made this visualization and said, huh, that looks weird. So in order to really get at this strategy of visualizing data in detail, um, I'd like to point any R users in the audience to this R package called Trelliscope JS. It is a fantastic package where if you have meaningful divisions in your data, so genes, proteins, metabolites, you break your data into those meaningful subsets, specify a visualization, and even potentially some metrics that go with each visualization. And with, if you're familiar with the tidyverse at all, with like two lines of code, if you're very R savvy, you can generate a web application that lets you look at every division of your data and sort and filter through it. So I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a second. Um, first, I need to go back to the example that I promised. And Kristen and Maria will correct me if I say anything biologically incorrect, but um, I wanna show you some data that was generated under Dr. Kristen Burnham Johnson's early career award through BER. So she's studying the impact of perturbation on microbial communities, particularly uh, leaf cutter ant fungal gardens, where they're looking at right, these gardens where, um, where this, Fungal garden is capable of efficient deconstruction of plant cell, cell wall biomass. And to really understand this system, they wanna understand how this system stays healthy and wards off different perturbations of infect, like such as infection. So um, one of the studies that was done, uh, this is a huge pipeline that Maria and Kristen would be happy to explain to you in detail, but I'm going to focus on what's at the top here. So they took their um, fungal garden and they did spatial metabolomics on it and um, looked 
at what features they have and put that into Metaspace to try to do metabolite annotation. There's complementary spatial proteomics data that went with this for today. I'm just going to talk about the spatial metabolomics. And I'm going to um, show you an example of Trelliscope. One thing I want to point out is at the bottom left of this image, you have an ant egg. Um, and the rest of this is fungal material from that garden. So we do expect that we might see some metabolites with different characteristics for this egg compared to the other portions of this garden. And I am going to attempt a live demo, so bear with me. Okay, so this is what Trelliscope looks like on the outset. And let me this away. Okay, what you can see is this is that fungal air, um, garden area. And what you probably can't quite see from your seat though, this is for one particular M over Z from the spatial metabolomics. And I've got some normalized intensities for what's going on here. So when I'm talking about divide and recombine detailed visualization, this Trelliscope tool will let me go through and visualize every one of these M over Zs. There are 751 of them. Right? Hopefully you think to yourself, why would I sit there and do that? Why would I look through 751 things? Um, one really nice feature is I can put this into a grid and you could start looking at multiple things at once and looking for common trends or patterns or unique trends or patterns across the different demo over Zs, right? But still, this is a lot of just manually looking at the data. You can very simply put in some of these metrics that I'm talking about. For example, um, I divided this, this is just the naive without knowing even what Kristen's data looks like and what the different features were. I need, naively broke this area up into 100 blocks. And I counted how many of those blocks had um, intensities greater than zero across them. So basically a metric of how much data is there. So I could look and I could come into Trelliscope. It shows me what the distribution of that metric is. I can come in and say, hmm, I wonder what this top section with the most blocks with data in them looks like. And I've now filtered down from 751 plots to 58. So these are the 58 M over Zs that have sort of collectively the most data scattered amongst um, this particular or these particular metabolites. And I might want to dig deeper. And I just calculated a very basic metric of uh, spatial dependence which is this guy. And I might come in and say, well, um, let me filter this and take things that have at least a spatial dependence of 0.6 or higher. You can see I'm down to 32 plots now. I can filter and go look through these. Or um, if I really want to hone in, it turns out I have the contrived example for you. I want to look for, if I look through these plots, I see that a lot of them are just a lot of noise throughout. I want to actually also look for things where there actually is some blank space. And if I filter down even further, um, I start to end up with plots that you can start to see some of these shapes of these fungal features that were in that optical image. This is just one example, some very basic metrics that I've put in. We could take um, Kristen's data. We could start calculating correlations of the optical image to the mass spec images and put those into this display. But the point here is that this really allows you to come in and if you're going to look at one plot at a time, lets you from a very objective perspective, 
try to find the interesting things in your data instead of falling back to your favorite genes or your favorite proteins or your favorite metabolites. And in this case, because there are 751 metabolites, uh, people who are working with this data, then Maria doesn't have to try to hand annotate everything that she possibly can. We can save some time and point out, hey, these are the interesting metabolites where things are happening and we actually care. Are you able to identify those using tools like Metaspace? All right. I'm going to go back to my slides briefly here. Maybe. All right, hopefully um, I've convinced you of the value of this tool. What I will say is if you're not an R programmer, what we've done to date is we have this tool that we've developed called the Multiomics Data Exploration Tool or MODE. And the video behind me, what you're gonna see is someone has loaded in normalized uh, lipidomics data. And this is also from that fungal garden data. This time, these are tubes of fungus where there's a gradient and infection. And um, in the video, we're setting up, what do I want each of my plots to look like? Do I want to plot presence absence? Do I want to plot normalized abundances? Do I want to change things like the um, axis labels? And instead of having to know how to do how to program in R, we've set up this tool so you can upload your data and it will generate Trelloscope displays for you based on some very common types of visualizations that we use um, for depending on what the data set is. So what we're looking for, this is my uh, shameless plug, is um, maybe the mode is part of a bigger platform, but I'm gonna just quickly show, this is the result of when someone clicked go on the last slide, it generated this trelloscope display, and now it's got some built-in metrics where they can start to sort and filter through all of their lipidomics data. This tool is part of a larger tool that we're building. See, that's called the multi-omics analysis portal. So this is really meant to be sort of a one-stop application store where you can perform quality control, visualize your data, do statistical analysis and integrate. Cool tools like mode. Um, we're looking for users with data that you think could benefit from these tools so that we can pilot and see how well they work and update changes into those tools. So we are having a EMSA Learn webinar on October 11th. Um, I think Heather said she can put the link in the Zoom chat, or you can also just email me. It's my first dot last name at pnnl.gov. I can uh, point you to this. We'd love to have you join, learn more about the tool, whether or not we could use your use you as a beta tester and or see if your data fits into any of these tools. With that, I will wrap up. And I wanna give um, huge kudos to Dr. Kristen Burnham Johnson and all of her data made this talk possible as well as the team. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Lisa. Time for questions. That is really cool. Thank you. Um, I just have questions, a little bit more of development from somebody who's not really good at developing our shiny apps, but have made a few. And so when you go from like your R code to the app and say you want to update it, there's been some change in the method. How is, easy is it for you to go and sort of remove shiny app? From it's not quite a shiny app. So it's okay. um, it really is you write like a function that's like, ggplot make this plot, right? And a different function that returns a data frame that has different metrics. And so you could, if you wanted to add a metric or take it away, you put it into that function and then just rerun the code and it will regenerate the web app. So it's, um, 
it's pretty useful and not too bad to change if you're somewhat savvy in R. That is a really cool talk, by the way. I really didn't like the whole application side of things. But um, I was just wondering, have you had a uh, chance to sort of test what the sort of limitation of this, like in terms of the size of the data or um, like have you like had a chance to look at those? Yeah, um, so the, the you are only limited by the machine that you're using. So a, I would say that just like a standard computer laptop desktop, I've processed you know, probably, probably slower than you would want, but I've processed up to like a terabyte of data on it. Um, if you start getting more than that, then you can you can process all of this on like an HPC, parallelize it, bring it back into R, and then launch. So you're really only limited by the amount of time that it takes to process the data. 